the Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. Welcome to the Instructor Podcast. This is a show that helps you become an even more awesome driving instructor. And as always, I am your splendid host, Terry Cook. I'm delighted to be here, but even more delighted that you have chosen to listen because we have got a very special show for you today. Because we are continuing our thing with road safety, but I am also diving into the banks of the Instructor Podcast Premium. That's right. Every season, I like to give you some content from the Premium to let you see what's going on over there. And we've got a couple of very special recordings for you today. So first up, I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Box. Now, back in December, I released a very special 12 Days of Christmas featuring 12 wonderful people, and one of them was Liz Box. And we spoke around Vision Zero and Drive Fit, and we go into details on the resources that you can share with your students and potentially their parents as well. Following on from that, I'm then joined by Stuart Lockery of Bright Coaching. Now, just a reminder that Bright Coaching are the sponsors of Season 7, and Stuart Lockery joined me recently to do an episode dissection where we dove into all things Bright Coaching and his episode on the podcast in 2023. So in that, we spoke around road safety and Stuart's thoughts on that, why he thinks it's important, and also got into some coaching topics. So two very special episodes for you today that I hope you enjoy, and if you do enjoy, hopefully you'll consider joining Premium. And the best place to join is to head over to www.theinstructorpodcast.com. You can find links and further information over there, or you can find a link in the show notes. But for now, let's get stuck into the episode. So welcome to the second day of Christmas, and on this second day of Christmas, at the present we are opening is Liz Box. How are we doing, Liz? Hi, Terry. Very good, thank you. And and thanks for having me back on the show. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, chat with you. No, you are more than welcome. As as I was mentioning beforehand, one of uh, my most popular guests ever. So delighted to have you back. And and before we get stuck in, I want to take a moment to congratulate you and make all of my lovely listeners and, and viewers aware that you recently won Prince Michael International Road Safety Award for your work with Drive Fit. So big congratulations for that. Oh, thank you ever so much. Yeah, absolutely delighted with the award. And, and we are going to be talking about drive in a moment, but I want to start off just by asking you about 2023. How was 2023 for you? Yeah, great question. It's always a good time to reflect, isn't it, at this time of year? So yeah, 2023 has been quite the year for me. So I, I guess one of the big highlights for me has been completing my my PhD, which has been, you know, over six years has been such a, a challenging and, and rewarding experience. And it's also opened up lots of exciting opportunities and, and sort of possibilities for the future. So that's great. I guess on top of that, I've also ventured into the entrepreneurial world, setting up my own consultancy business earlier on this year. And it's been really exciting to to build something from, from the ground up, you know, making good use of my PhD skill set and, and also having that freedom to to sort of shape my own kind of professional path. So um, that's been great. I've also been really enjoying working with Copilot, which started this year too. So, you know, working in that kind of agile road safety education startup space, which is really trying to provide something new to the existing landscape. That's, that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can achieve in 2024 with that. And obviously, as you've just mentioned, you know, to round off the year, I was delighted that the, the driver intervention that I developed and, and trialled and tested for my PhD research was awarded a prestigious Prince Michael International Road Safety Award. You know, it's, it's really wonderful to see that program of work awarded for the research and the number of partners involved in, in the project. And for me, it's just a really excellent opportunity to, to share the program with others, get it a sort of a level of exposure, increase people's awareness and encourage others to kind of make use of the resources that are there and what's being gleaned from the project. It, I think I mentioned it on the last session that we had that I was uh, publishing a report in November at the foundation called Empowering Young Drivers with Road Safety Education. So that's all been published now. And it's really great to kind of get all of the findings of my PhD research out there and, and may well be interesting for your listeners to kind of have a look at that. And really the key message coming from that report was, you know, shock and, shock and tell tactics to teach teenagers about risks associated with driving 
does little to improve their safety and actually may make things worse. So it's got plenty of ideas in there about what we should be talking to young people about with driving. And probably the last thing I would say is, you know, beyond the world of academia and my work, it's I've been engaging in various sort of dissemination and communication opportunities this year. And at the foundation where I work, that's really important because it ensures that we're meeting our aim of translating research findings into policy and practice and talking to people about the findings. It was really great. I've contributed to a couple of BBC recordings this year, uh, one for the the One Show and, and one for the documentary a film that will be published next year on young drivers. Actually, funnily enough, both were recorded at the British Motor Museum in Gaydon, which is a fantastic place to, to visit. And I'm sure you and, and your listeners will have been there as well. So, and of course, finally, I, I have to mention, obviously, the Meganaro I recorded with you back in August, obviously a big highlight at the, the midpoint of the year. And obviously our follow-up podcast chat. And, and, you know, it's great to be rounding off the year, having a chat with you now. Hey, what, what a year that's been. That's quite impressive. What I, what I would say is that I'm not saying it's because of the Instructor Podcast, but you only achieved that award after your appearance on the podcast. So, you know. Yes, we'll build some up to there. it. <laughs> you mentioned your consultancy business you've set up there. Just tell us a little bit more about that, what, what, what that entails. Yeah, so I'm finishing my PhD. So I submitted back in March, and obviously there's a long tail to PhDs in terms of vivas and final completion. So that all finished off in September. But when I when I finished, I very much wanted to be able to offer the skills and expertise that I developed as part of my PhD to help practitioners and policymakers develop really good evidence based interventions. And I, I knew there was a gap out there. And I started working with Copilot at the time as well. So I have a retainer consultancy with with Copilot as part of my work. And you know, I've picked up a couple of other um, consultancy roles over over the year, which, which has been great. It's really good actually to work. I love working in collaboration with others because you know, when you're specialist, you can only do part of the picture. But when you can bring others in, that's where I think really great things can happen. And you know, being setting up your own consultancy means you can come in on some bigger projects and offer some insight and and work with others. So, yeah, it's taken off in a way that I hadn't quite expected. It'll be interesting to see what happens over 2024. Excellent. Well, speaking of 2024, one of the, the things that I want to get driving instructors thinking about into that year is more around road safety and 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 the, the different campaigns and charities and organisations that, that we can get involved in, the information we can take and all that kind of stuff. So I was thinking back to our episode and I, I've got one regret and it's I didn't ask you enough about Drive Fit. So it seems appropriate to get you on here to speak about that. So do you want to tell us a bit about Drive Fit, about what it is, where it came from? Yeah, great. No, thanks for the opportunity, Terry. I, I love talking about something I've spent such a long time on and actually I think is really important for the sector in terms of a step change in how we're delivering road safety education. Traditionally, road safety education has typically been very much knowledge orientated. You know, here's some facts, please do better. Whereas we know from behavioural psychology that that's just not how we work. We can know what the right thing is to do, but actually doing it is a completely different thing. So being able to design it as part of my PhD research and bringing in the behavioural psychology and the theories into it has been really, really important. And we know that currently what's been going into schools has been designed based on people's beliefs about what will work and often practitioners or emergency service workers or bereaved family members, and they have the absolute best intentions. But we need to make sure that what we're delivering is evidence-based and is actually having the effects that we expect it to do. So that was very much kind of the the genesis of this project in the sector, realising that we really needed to, we had an understanding that maybe we shouldn't be doing some of the things that we were, but we didn't know quite what to put in its place. So that was very much what I was doing here. So in essence, dry fit goes beyond those traditional approaches and incorporates, you know, behavioural science and behaviour change techniques and implementation intentions, which are essentially if this situation occurs, then what are you going to do? I mean, the traditional one we all think of is if I've been driving for two hours, then I need to take a, a 20 minute break. And it it really helps because it puts it ingrains it in the memory system. It actually makes that goal into something that you're more likely to do in the moment. And it's really important that we do that in all different areas of life. So it was, it was trying very much to, to get into that. So the drive fit intervention itself used a two part approach. It began with a 40 minute film which was delivered in a classroom setting. And the film took on a sort of talk show style interview format. So it featured expert guests providing information, demonstrations and tips about managing, you know, the learning to drive process. It also addressed 
risky driving behaviors associated with speeding, tiredness, mobile phone use and intoxicated driving. So a whole gamut of things that we know that young people may be finding really challenging when they've, re- they've first passed their test. So following the film, the participants also engaged in a 45 minute online facilitated workshop within two weeks of watching the film. The workshop used what's called the ORID framework, which essentially is a focused conversation method, which encourages participants to remember the film and then extract relevant learning to their personal situations. So in the past, we deliver quite blanket coverage interventions. What we wanted to do with this was actually design something that was relevant to an individual. individual. Some individual might say, well, I'm never intending to take drugs, but actually I can foresee that I'm going to have problems potentially keeping within the speed limit if I'm late for work. So it's wanting to make it relevant to people and not getting them to turn off to what you're doing. So the workshops for the research trial were were delivered online using Microsoft Teams, and it was delivered by professional facilitators, which was actually really important because they're trained in being able to facilitate those discussions and really work through problems. And I think that kind of helps with that personalization. We had interactivity in the session so they could have online tools that they used and were, were voting with Mentimeter. And it really, at the end of the session, helped them develop those sort of action plans so they could kind of put that into action in terms of what am I likely to find difficult and challenging and how can I address that? So And then there was a whole host of of materials that were provided in terms of a notebook, website for parents and guardians, and sort of these essential kind of postcards to take away with the kind of if-then plans to help ingrain them in the memory system. So that was very much what was trialled as part of the research. Initially, we'd hoped to be able to do something a bit more in person, but it was delivered completely within, you know, the COVID world of 2021, where schools were back, but getting visitors into schools was really challenging. So I think what's going to be interesting going forwards is I'm really hopeful that we're going to be able to iterate the programme. Some schools this year are kind of delivering that to their students, but it's very quite a lot for the teachers because they have to facilitate the sessions themselves. Whereas I, I've got a bid in for some funding, which I'm really hoping will be successful, that we can actually go through and actually redesign the film so that it can have interactive sessions in in between and really kind of keep the engagement levels going. Active learning is really important. And obviously you guys as instructors know that better than anyone else. You know, just telling people information is not going to do it. It's kind of getting them engaged and seeing how it's relevant to them. So yeah, hopefully that gives you a bit more of a view on on the drive fit program. I, I guess the final thing to say is it's for, for your listeners, if they want to see any of the films that were developed as part of Dry Fit, as I say, it was a 40 minute film, but we've chunked it up into smaller bite size um, topic areas. Those are available on the Road Safety GB website under, if you just search for Dry Fit, you'll find the page. And that's got those individual films. So if, for instance, instructors want to use that as a, as a clip to start a discussion with students, they're very welcome to do so, or even parents might find it helpful to to view if, if there's some engagement with parents and guardians. Yeah, I must admit, I've only utilised the film so far and how I've used it is because you kind of break the videos into different chunks. You know, you can watch the full video or there's, I think, four different topics mm-hmm. and I've sent them out to students in, as the smaller chunks and I think that it's interesting seeing which ones they're watching because I'll ask them when they come back and, and mm-hmm. different students are picking different ones to watch. And, but I, I love that that film. I genuinely thought it was, it was really impressive the the presenter on it i felt and again i don't know whether the idea whether this was acting or genuine but she was asking the questions that someone who was just a general driver would ask you know not a professional and and the way that the the road safety experts were replying was 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 really interesting and really good and you know one particular point to that for me where it was like it has a perception thing i think it was uh, professor david crundle that was there and they were on the the video they're turning right and the, the lady in the VR headset, completely missed the oncoming car. And you could see it shook her a little, up a little bit in the VR headset. And it, it was brilliant seeing where these people are looking. So, so yeah, for the, the instructors listening, I would definitely look at start, send them out to, to students. But how, how else, is there any other way that instructors could utilise this, do you think? Yeah, and, and that's really great to have that, that feedback, Terry, because that's exactly what we wanted the presenter to be. We wanted them to be a curious person who could ask the right questions that the audience would want to ask because we knew the audience wasn't there so we wanted to bring that in so that's really good that that came across because that was definitely our intention 
In terms of other ways, I, I would say if if your audience had a look at the Road Safety GB website, there's kind of an intervention guide and it goes through this focus conversation method in more detail. And I think that's a really, really interesting tool. It's been used in schools and essentially it's called, so it's ORID. So you talk about the objective facts of the situation. You then go and talk about how people feel about it and what's relevant to them and then kind of move on to well, what's the interpretation of that. And then finally, what's the decision that you're actually going to take? And you can do a really nice focused conversation in, in quite a short period of time, but it kind of leads to a nice conclusion. And it it also helps with kind of dealing with the facts first. It kind of makes it not personal straight away. It's the facts are the facts and it just gets people talking. And as I say, it's a, it's a tool that professional facilitators use a lot when they're facilitating group discussions. And I think it's something that is a really kind of quite powerful tool to potentially use with students. So that's something I'd recommend instructors have a look at and, and see if that could be implemented during those sort of discussions. And you mentioned there about presenter again, and, and I, I want to ask you actually just a brief question on that, because there were several points during that that film where the presenter is seen more concerned by the penalty. So what I mean by that is, that I forget the guests, but they were talking about the collision you know, the potential for death in a, in a, mm-hmm. in a car accident or, or however you want to phrase it. And then she, she asked, what's the penalty for that? Mm-hmm. And seemed more concerned about the penalty for speeding rather than the actual risk of, you know, an incident. Is that mm-hmm. something you come across a lot, that people are more concerned about, oh dear, I might get done for speeding rather than, oh dear, I might have a crash? Yes. So again, that's fascinating you've picked that up. So what we know from the research is that young people are less influenced by death consequences and injury consequences because we all know, thankfully, although there's far too many deaths and injuries on the road, it's still a relatively rare phenomenon. We And, and I think people's everyday experience is they could be in a car with somebody that's not doing the right thing and they could get away with it in terms of not injuring themselves or others or not getting a penalty of any type. So what what the evidence seems to suggest is we need to be focusing on consequences that are much more immediate and impactful to that group. So it's not to say that's not important, but it's we're not finding from the evidence that's what's influencing their behaviours. And penalties is one of the areas that, that could because you get a whole load of stuff taken away from you if you've suddenly and you've been driving for two years and you can only get six penalty points and you get caught on your mobile phone once. Well, that means you're back to L plates. And as part of the research, I ran some focus groups of young people and it was fascinating to hear all of their questions about, well, what's the law on this and what what happens next? They were really, they knew a lot about the highway codes, but they didn't necessarily know from the, obviously it's a small sample, but they didn't know kind of what the implications were of their behaviours. And, you know, that has an immediate impact. And I think some of the work that it seems that DFT have got planned for next year, certainly for this audience, is about the social consequences of behaviour, which for young people is much more immediate and much more impactful because it's more likely to happen in any given week. And they know what the impact is to them if they are ostracised in any way socially and actually how that feels. So, I think it's about trying to use the levers that are going to be most influential for individuals. And that's what we were trying to do in the film is, is, is bring those forward a little bit. It's, it's just reminding me of something that I did a few years ago when I used to have a Facebook group for my, my learners. And I put a poll up in there. And I think I remember right about 30 of them answered this question. I said, if on a driving test, an examiner had to use a brake because you were about to crash my car, what would bother you more? The fact you'd failed the test or the fact that you're about to crash my car. And there were a few of them that said they'll be more bothered they'd fail the test, mm-hmm. which, again, just reinforces what you're saying about that immediacy, that 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 thing that bothers them. So, yeah, that just... <laughs> yeah, I guess they flashback. might have told their friends that they were taking their driving test and they might have to admit that they didn't pass. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's interesting and that they admitted that to you. <laughs> yes, there were probably a couple that, that didn't admit that. <laughs> Maybe if I... Okay, so one of the things I'm going to be doing more of next year is is, is embracing the road safety vision zero and, and what I'm referring as bridging the gap between in driving instructors and that. And one thing I wanted to get from you today was vision zero. So could you explain to my lovely listeners what vision zero is? Yeah, so vision zero is essentially what's seen as a, a bit of a revolutionary strategy. And it's actually got a really, really bold mission, which is to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries whilst promoting 
safe, healthy and equitable mobility for for everyone. So it's essentially a really transformative approach and it's really gained a lot of traction, not only in Europe, but in Australasia and North America. And it's increasingly being embraced at both the city level and national level. So you'll see more and more Vision Zero kind of strategies coming forward. So as a concept, it was originally implemented in Sweden in during the 1990s. And it's it's essentially a philosophy which challenges our traditional views of traffic-related deaths and says these deaths are not inevitable. There is something that we can do about them. So instead, Vision Zero recognizes that deaths are preventable and that that humans being fallible are require like a systems approach to safety. So it essentially means that we're not just focusing on what an individual did or didn't do, but also considering how laws, business processes, social connections and other things can influence the outcome. So it's not just saying that person did a bad thing. It's thinking, well, actually, could we could the business have looked at, well, how many hours is their employee working? Should they be driving to and from a meeting or to a job and and what the responsibilities are there? So essentially, Vision Zero really stands firm in that belief that traffic deaths can be prevented. And ultimately, it's it's not just a goal, it's that paradigm shift into how we kind of approach road safety. And it acknowledges that every life is valuable and preventable losses are really not a price we have to pay for mobility. So it's it's very much kind of what it's focusing on. So the most recent UN General Assembly on Global Road Safety, which took place in 2022, saw a commitment to cut road deaths and injuries by 50% by, by 2030. And this is obviously a really important milestone in sort of the Vision Zero approach. You might have seen that the WHO published their global status report on road safety recently, and that revealed that there's only been a 5% drop in road traffic deaths between 2010 and 2021. But that's obviously against a, a doubling of, of global road traffic and a significant increase in, in road networks a, a across the world. So Europe has actually done a bit better. So the report it, it reported a 36% decline in deaths since 2010 in Europe. And this was seen to be largely because Europe has a sort of safe systems approach. And, you know, clearly we're even in Europe a long way off meeting that, that 2030 goal. So... I think to be able to to achieve what we need to do, we really need to take a different approach. And it's always said, but I think all of that low hanging fruit has been done. You know, we've we've made improvements to vehicle safety. We've we've got really important laws in place in terms of, you know, blood alcohol limit. Or obviously, there's a debate about whether we should reduce that. You know, in, in the UK as well, in line with Europe. But I think what we feel at the foundation is if we are going to really get down to what are the causal factors and what can we do to influence this, looking at user behavior, the road network, vehicles and speeds that we should be traveling, we really need something like a road safety investigation branch to take a sort of a no blame approach to looking at those causal factors and understanding them and also aggregating that huge amount of data we have now out there. You you might have come across there's a number of companies that have sprung up that are providing data that's collected from vehicles that are collecting data that can see you know speeds and and harsh braking and there's a wealth of information out there at the moment but you know in the UK and we have a great statistics database with stats 19 we're not consistently joining together that was the health data set to really understand what happened all the way through that collision to understand what the impact were on injuries and actually what we could do to reduce that so I think there's huge potential, but we we need the the political will to want to do it and to see it as important and to see it as a public health issue and a public health crisis. I mean, road traffic injuries are the leading cause of death of of five to twenty nine year olds worldwide, which is just absolutely staggering that that is the case. But that is true, and it's the twelfth leading cause of death for all other age groups. So it's a massive issue and it needs to be treated like we treat other health issues to really kind of get behind that. But, you know, as far as Vision Zero, I think it's a really important kind of step in the right direction because it's saying that that these are preventable. We we can reduce to zero. We shouldn't accept road death as an inevitable consequence of mobility and we need to do better. I mean, I could talk to you about this all day, but I want to touch on one point there, which is I like the way you've explained that. It's not 
just the idea of not having an accident on the on incident on the road ever. It's about the whole process there. You mentioned the safe system, which encompasses everything, as you said, from businesses to first aid courses to coroners. You know, I know it kind of encompasses that. And I think one thing we need to do as driving instructors is take a real look at the role we play in that safe system. Because I don't think we do. I don't think we look at our role in that. I think we can be guilty at times of, I'm just teaching someone to drive. And yes, well, we are. And yes, that is his job. And, and as nine to five, if you like, I think that we do play a role in that safe system. And uh, we need to recognize that fact at times. Would, would you concur? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we've talked before about the really important role I personally think driving instructors play, which is that of signposting, because you have your specific role of making sure that somebody can safely drive a vehicle and to get through their driving test. But we we know, particularly for young drivers, that there's things that post learning to drive that are really important, the kind of minimizing passengers for that first six months if they can and, and not driving at night, because those are the most risky times and really building up that experience, making sure they've got a decent vehicle as much the best vehicle they can afford given their, their price back bracket, because that's going to protect them if they are involved in a collision. And also getting that kind of telematics insurance, which kind of provides that continuing coach in the car when they're still learning and actually can help them say, look, I can't speed because I've got this in my car and you know it can support them and being safer as well so things that you can do to encourage them to you know great thing about vehicle choice and, and telematics is you make that choice once and then that supports their safety going forwards over the next year or two well, it's, which is much easier than you know we, when we talk about behaviors we have to make these behaviors every time we get behind the wheel and so as much as we can make these things you know it's like setting safe drive mode on your on your mobile phone you do that and you've done it once and then you're not going to be distracted by your phone by driving anymore and it's it's a lot easier to do than to try and consistently keep on changing people's behavior and encouraging them to follow on from what they actually want to do so yeah no i think it's it's really important well i'm going to put a pin in that for now keywords for now and i just want to finish off by asking you what have you got coming up in 2024 anything fun yeah. So, you know, lots coming up. So after a busy year, I'm very much looking forward to a, a nice Christmas break, like I'm sure lots of people are. And after which I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up for actually quite an exciting 2024. Uh, you know, I'm hoping, as I mentioned earlier, to have the opportunity to reiterate and enhance the, the Drive Fit program further. And I'm currently actively working on securing funding to support that. So I'm really hopeful that will come through in, in 2024 to because I always believe it's really important to develop what you've got and to improve things continually. And that would be really great. Um, with regard to my consultancy work, I've got some really interesting commissions that I'm working on in the driver education space, working on both the design and the evaluation of education programs. And it would be really great to be able to share those at the appropriate time next year once the, the results are out. And as I mentioned earlier, it's just great to be collaborating with really interesting, insightful people across the industry. And, you know, I want to do as much as that as possible in 2024. With Copilot, I really hope that we can continue the momentum that we've got in 2023, focus on building a more robust library of resources for our members. And I think really the aim for Copilot next year is to reach that critical mass of support that we need to allow us not just to survive as a new company, but get us thriving as a startup. So. You know, it, it's an exciting journey to be on and I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can achieve on that front in 2024. And I think at the RAC Foundation, my work there, I think it's gearing up to be a significant year in the realm of national policy. You know, we've got an upcoming election and it's going to be crucial that we position ourselves as an organisation to influence and inform and ensure that the necessary information and advice is there for a new government across all of our areas of interest. So obviously we're talking about safety here today, but at the foundation we focus on economy issues, environment and mobility issues too, and that, that, that broader transport policy piece. So yes, I, I guess in short, I'd say, I, I hope 2024 will be a year of kind of innovation, collaboration and advocacy and building on that momentum of, of 2023, which has been a fantastic year. So yeah, fingers crossed for some positive grant funding, um, impactful consultancy projects, and for us to get that thriving community and co-pilot and really successful endeavours at, at the foundation. It sounds like you're going to have an exciting 2024 too. So it'd be interesting to hear kind of what comes out from, from you next year too. Yes, definitely. Lots of fun stuff coming up, as like for you. But uh, there's going to be loads of interesting links put in the show notes for people. But do you want to take a moment just to tell people where they can find you if they want to reach out or find any more Liz Box goodness? <laughs> well, 
Yeah, probably the best place to find me is just on LinkedIn because I tend to link to various different projects that I'm involved with there. If you wanted to get an email address, just go to the RAC Foundation web- website, contact us and I can be contacted there. So those are probably the, the two most easy places to, to get hold of me. Smashing. Well, uh, thank you for joining us today. I hope that as this goes out, you're having a great Christmas and I hope you have a great new year. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. So we'll be back with more in just a moment. But I want to give a quick shout out to some of the latest signups to the Instructor Podcast Premium, and they are Felicity Hargreaves, Vicky Reeve, Phil, Andy McFarlane, Michelle, and Ian McKenzie. Now, these guys have got access to over 75 hours of exclusive content, much like the content you're listening to now, including the wonderful episode you just heard from Dr. Elizabeth Box and the episode you're about to hear with Stuart Lockery, where I was joined by some of my lovely premium members to watch live and interact. And if you sign up today, you'll get access to all this stuff straight away. On top of that, you'll get access to trainings around coaching and mindfulness and mental health, social media, and even the standards check. We recently had an amazing presentation by the ADI and PDI Dr. Lee Sperry all around lesson planning within the standards check. And we've currently just kicked off a season on how to be confident and competent and consistent around those competencies and uh, some great feedback so far. So if you want to sign up to enhance your CPD, then you can either use a link in the show notes, you can visit the website www.theinstructorpodcast.com or you can drop me a message. I'm always welcome to have a chat. But for now, let's get stuck back into the show. So welcome to another edition of an episode of Dissection. This is a show we dive into a former, a previous, I can never think of the right word, episode and take a look at some of the key components. And today we are going back to season six, episode one, with one of my favorite titles ever for a podcast, which is The Future's Bright, The Future's Coaching. And that was a last minute change, because I think if you go back onto the premium content and have a look, I think it was actually called something else. And then I edited for the public one that went out because it was like the day before ridiculously proud of that title and of course that was with the scottish sensation that is stuart locker who is kind enough to join us tonight how are we doing stuart i'm very well terry how are you all the better for seeing your smiley face obviously so let's try it we're going to try it one more time and if it fails we're never going to do it again stuart i love you i know yes there we go right that's made my day we're ending the episode there such a weight off my shoulders. Such a weight. Yeah. And mine. It's like four I can look, attempts now. I can look my daughter in the face again. I will clip this and send it to her. I have almost as much pride from that moment as I do from the Taylor Swift video I created recently, which is my current highlight of 2024. But yes, you can enough to join us for this episode, Stuart. So I think the first thing I want to ask you, just before we get stuck into some of my, my key takeaways, is thinking back, how good was it? that you were able to literally kind of do a podcast tour. You did the instructor, you did, I think it was called Cowley's Instructor Training Podcast at the time, and then was it Josh's YouTube slash podcast channel, and then I think you got onto Kevin Selwood's podcast. How good was it that you could actually do a tour to promote this thing? It was it was amazing. It was amazing. It's um, just one of these fortunate things that it wasn't planned at all. It wasn't deliberate. If I tried to do it that way, it would never have worked out that all three podcasts were coming out within two weeks, was it, of two, two to three weeks of, of launching the, the the qualification? It was brilliant. Yeah, I can't I can't thank you guys enough for for the for, for the vehicle, I suppose, to kind of get my face out there and, and my voice. Yeah, really good. And well, there's been a lot of talk recently about there being too many podcasts and too much not necessarily cpd but too many different platforms but i just think it's great that you can go on on this multitude of of different places and be caught in different areas and you know people that don't listen to this show will potentially listen to the others so i think that's great but but we're here to talk about the the best podcast which is obviously the instructor podcast so what are your recollections of the the episode because this was i think the first one you did so just thinking back what are your re- recollections of the episode of the the feedback you got that kind of stuff can I just pick you up on the best podcast? Do you have any kind of evidence? Have you been made aware of any recognition recently that 
validates your claim to being the best podcast. I mean, some people win Oscars, other people win Go Rodeo Awards, you know. I didn't I didn't know that. Very well done. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, so, so, and someone content creator of the year for the first year. Some would argue, yeah, belated. Well, not belated. Yeah, belated. Some will argue it's later than it should have been, but I'll let, that's for other people to judge. But yes, the people have spoken. The people have spoken, shall we say. So what what's were your thoughts appearing on the best podcast of the year in 2023? Officially. I mean it was it was it was a future privilege. It was a future <laughs> privilege. To, yeah, definitely. No, as I say, it was it was it was very, very good. I listened back to the episode a couple of times after after we did it. And you do that whole kind of cringe thing anytime you're listening to yourself. And there was a couple of things I said that I kind of felt myself cringing at. But overall, I think I got I got my main thing across, I think, which is my my kind of genuine belief in what I'm doing. My my genuine belief in the stuff that I want to get across to ADIs. I think I think that came across well. I think I realised that I talk too much, so I'll try and speak in shorter sentences today. I disagree. I don't think you talk too much. I think it's genuinely the way I put the show out. I open the platform for, for you guys and let you speak, and there's only one person I have to regularly interrupt, and we can guess who that is. But the, the one last thing I do want to mention about that was I dive into my stats quite right. In fact, you got in the, the top five episodes of the year, didn't you? I forget what number you were, but you were in the top five. I just remembered that. I think I was but, number three. I think I got number three. Yes, you, that's right. You were the the highest kind of solo episode. I think mm-hmm. above you, we had the six for 60, and then we had the, the Lou Walsh in memoriam episode. So yeah, that was a, a good achievement. But the I, I dive into my stats a lot, and I check every day, and I look and see what episodes people listen to every day. Every single day since our episode, people have listened to that episode. Oh, wow. We're not always the same person. <laughs> Is it you <laughs> every day? It's honestly not me. It's honestly not me, no. I've got so many other podcasts to choose from, Terry. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, Sorry. every day since, you know, it's been listened to by by at least a few people. So I think that's quite cool. But I, I want to come on to my key takeaways. So I've got my three key takeaways from this. And the first one is something a little bit different because normally I have very kind of specific points that I've picked up from each episode. But this was kind of an overall thing from the episode. It was the growth of Bright Coaching. And in sort of parallel with that, the growth of you, because it wasn't intentional, but listening back, I kind of realized that we we traced the growth of Bright Coaching, going from your you know humble beginnings in the hotels and that kind of stuff, right through to where you are now. You know, we spoke about the you stepping out of your comfort zone to, to try and promote the thing on the podcast and in, in public and getting to speak at the, the expo for the first time. And that was your goal to promote and that kind of stuff. And how you went about getting on the honest truth and the the stuff you integrated into it, like the driver psychology and behavioral change, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just intrigued sort of looking back now, because I know the journey is not over, but looking back now, how does it feel looking back on that whole journey? to see where you are now with Bright Coaching. It's really interesting you picked up on that because one of the, just come back to our earlier conversation, one of the things I'm most pleased that I managed to speak about on the podcast was the role of my mentor, Graham Gibson. If you listen to the episode, it was about how he helped me progress in my career and you know, took me with him whenever we went to, to, to work in different hotels. And you know, very fortunate and all that kind of stuff. And as I was listening to that today, I was thinking, you know, the, the bright coaching stuff is something that he would have been involved in if he'd been around, because I would have been phoning him or going to meet him. Because I stopped working with him like years ago, and then I still used to go and see him about my business, about employing people and all that kind of stuff, and, and getting his input. So that career path, if you like, of the the, the, the new business, but my personal career path. Yeah, I kind of wish I wish Graham was here to see it because he's still a huge part of, of of who I am. In terms of the company, the with John, you know, I don't I don't want to sound arrogant about it, but the company is where I hoped it would be. We sold out the first course really quickly. I mean, that was let's be honest, that's beyond my wildest expectations to sell it out as quickly as we did. And you played a big part in that with the podcast and the timing of it. But to have sold out the course. Couple of months or a couple of weeks before it starts, if, if I was sitting here now, and 
with places sold, a good, a really good number of places sold on Cohort 2. That's, that's as much as I could have hoped for at, the, at this time. And I knew that I would be really busy at this point in time. You know, we go live in two weeks. Fiona's going to be there. And there's, there's stuff that's been tidied up. There's threads that have been gathered together and, you know, pushed into needles and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's, it's where I want to be. It's where I want to be. And you're right, there's a lot more to do because I've only sold, I only have 30 odd clients out of, you know, I'm not going to get 40,000 driving instructors, but if my maximum audience within this industry is a couple of thousand, then I have, I've, I've still got a huge way to go. I, I think it's just fascinating when you spoke about the, the, the growth and development of the whole thing, because it's the challenges you've faced. You know, I mentioned it on the show, but that idea of you stepping out of your comfort zone to to go and speak at the expo and that being a goal and me being surprised by that because you you strike me as I, I, I the reason i say the scottish hand solo is you've got this calm cool persona and so to hear that that you face these challenges and then getting the honest truth on board now you were almost a little bit starstruck with ollie around that and it was just really fascinating because there are lots of parallels to to what i do you know, and the times when I've been starstruck speaking to people and the times when I've gone and spoken and the challenges I face doing this are two completely different things, obviously, but the, it's that same thing. And I think I would just like to ask, you know, there are lots of people growing stuff at the minute or at least thinking about developing some of it. So what, what message would you potentially have for those people that are maybe where you were a few years ago, but are a bit nervous about taking that step? So the first piece of advice, if you're if you're growing something or you're developing something, is to make sure your biggest competitor goes out of business. <laughs> That's the biggest incentive you can have to clear your desk and get a project finished. But on a serious note, the biggest, yeah, yeah, I, 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 genuinely, the, the probably the biggest impact on me getting this project finished was having a coach, and. I didn't deliberately go out to get a coach for this. I was given a coach as part of the diploma I was doing, the, the ILM Level 5 Diploma in Coaching and Development. And one of my cohorts on, the, on that qualification helped me tremendously in terms of the public speaking stuff, you know, coming up with coping strategies for that kind of stuff. And she's not, and, you know, my coach wasn't a public speaker, you know, backing up that idea that, Coaches don't need to be subject experts. But she also helped me let go of my other business, my driving school, and you know, give other people more responsibility and just help me get in my head where I wanted to be, where I was going, and clarify what I needed to do and what I needed to start saying no to. So that was that was huge. So so that that's that's two things. One of them hung in cheek, obviously. But then the final thing. I guess you talked about, you know, challenges being overcome and all that kind of stuff. And I, 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 know, I know you didn't mean it this way, but let, 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 let's be honest. We, we're, we're business people. We're trainers. And it, this, is, this is a job that we do. And we need to pay the bills. We need to pay our mortgages. That, that's the biggest challenge that we face. Anything that I have to do in my life at the moment in terms of getting over myself and standing up in front of some people to sell a product is not a challenge in the grand scheme of things when we think about health challenges that people are going through and all that kind of thing. So a, bit, a little bit of reality, a little bit of reality check. And I, I, I have an ego. I'm quite arrogant when I, when, I, when I need to be. But I like to think about I can also get my feet on the ground when I need to and just get my head down and do the work. And that's what I like to do. I, I like that. And I just touched on a couple of things. I know the one line that surprised me and stood out for me during the episode was, sort of just thrown out there that your know, competition decided to eat itself. And I'm like, oh, I didn't see that coming. That was a, an interesting comment. But yeah, did you know what the coach one there is fascinating? Because I think a lot of people kind of balk at that idea. And it's something I've done. You know, you Robin Bates has been a contributor to this, this podcast a few times. He was on the, the most recent Megana. And he's someone that I've worked with a lot. He's been by my side on a lot of this stuff. He's not necessarily been a coach every step of the way, but he's the guy that, he's my first port of call. If so, I'm struggling with something, it's on phone to Robin. You know, I'll book a, an hour session with him straight away. And it's like, I've said it before, there, there wouldn't be a 
a podcast without him. Well, there might be, but it'll be completely different and three years down the line. Even like Dan Meredith, who has been on the show, I spent six months working with Dan. These things, you get to see how different people's brains work and the stuff I've taken from them into driving lessons, never mind just on this. So yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great show. And underrated, and I can understand why people balk it as well. You know, it's that idea of, what? Well, so I'm going to have to fork out. It's like, well, yes, but you want people to fork out for your stuff. So it's kind of, you've got to make it balanced, like you said. I think there's so many people who still don't understand what coaching is. They, they probably think it is therapy and they're going to have to start talking about their parents and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I'm, I'm a convert to that, that famous kind of phrase that is, I can't remember if it was the guy from Google, everyone needs a coach. I'm a, I'm a convert to that. And, and like, <laughs> as, as coaching tells us, you can't tell people that they need a coach. They have to figure it out for themselves. That's, that's the paradox, isn't it? Do you know what? You're 100% right. And it, it's, but it's, it's hearing stories like yours that help people figure that out. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that, well, hold on. So Stuart, it's, an, it's almost like Stuart said, me and he had help. So I could get help. That's fine. And it's almost giving yourself permission, but, but yeah, I like that. But I do want to move on. I want to move on to the, the the second key takeaway of mine, which is a bit more specific. And I was listening back to the episode again, and I was regretful that I didn't push you, not push you, quiz you a little bit more on this. So it was your passion around the ADI and GAC. You know, you mentioned it several times with, with no prompting from me, but you can see your passion in that association. So I think and I never asked you about it, and I kind of regret a little bit, but so I'm going to take the opportunity now. Where does that passion come from? Um, so I was invited to join the ADI NGC. I can't even tell you when, 2017, maybe. I'm, I'm looking a year out there. It was well before COVID. And I was invited to go along by Andrew Love, who's a mate of mine, and another mate called Ed Marshall. And I, 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 I've spoken about this somewhere else, but at the time, I was I was up in Sco- I was up in Glasgow, obviously, and wasn't much going on in Glasgow in the kind of ADI, IDI scene that appealed to me. Maybe Fiona will back me up on this. To the extent that I had to go to Milton Keynes to do my BTEC level four with tri coaching, so there was no training. And it was through the, the BTEC that I met Andrew and Ed, and you know the tri coaching stuff was was brilliant. I'm on record as saying that you know that that kind of changed my life a lot in terms of my attitudes to goal setting and all that kind of stuff. But the, you know, the crowd of try coaching, it was a, it was very much a, a beer and curry crowd. And the guys who are listening will know who they are. So you, it was kind of work hard and play hard, which suited to the hospitality background. When I went to the ADI and JC, it was a lot more professional than try coaching. And it was just full of, I'm trying to think how to say it. I, I want to say like the elders of the industry. But I don't mean that in a patronising way. It was a very, very good way that I realised that there were people in this industry who had been doing it for years who weren't cynical and bitter about about a lot of things. And the only person I knew like that was Peter Harvey and the guy who trained me to be an instructor. And they were the only two in Scotland who I knew that fitted that criteria. And then I went to the NGC and there were all these kind of wise men and women who'd been doing the job for many, many years and who had grown an association from a large association from something very, very small. And, you know, we go for dinner with like the president, Neil Peake, the treasurer, Peter Boxall, and you know, these guys are in their seventies now, well into their seventies. And they, they, they tell the stories about the NGC meetings, having like five people there. Maybe, and then they'd eventually got up to 20, but they didn't have any money in the bank account to pay for the meeting room. So the president at the time was paying for the meeting rooms and the biscuits and the sandwiches out of his own pocket and not telling anyone because they, they felt that the association was that important. It gave driving instructors somewhere to go. And this is literally the 70s here, Terry. I wanted, I nearly said 30 years ago, but it's not, it's 60 years ago. So it must have been later than that, it must have been the 80s. But you get the point, you get the point. It inspired me and I, dr- I drove back up to Glasgow and I, I just figured that's, that's the kind of room that I want to be in. And the same way that you come on to one of your podcasts now, and do the green room kind of stuff, and you or you go to a conference, and you realise that this is where you want to be. This is where it's happening. This is where you feel comfortable. There's good vibes. 
good vibes. You go away feeling inspired and you want to go do, do good stuff. That's what I got at the NGC. And I stuck with it. And I, yeah, I'm just really good pals with all the, the guys in the committee. You know, Dan, you know, Tom Stenson. Tom, Tom's relatively new, but so, so many good people just doing things for the right reasons. Just a follow up question on, on the, the NGC then, because maybe this is not just the NGC, but all the associations. Where do you think the bitterness comes from? Because there's a lot of bitterness towards the associations. Where do you think that comes from and what message would you have to those people? Because there will be some people listening to this that feel that, that bitterness. Where does the bitterness come from? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I, I, I think it's, I think a lot of it is, you know, the, the, the same as the keyboard warriors about the DVSA. I think the vast majority of people who do it have probably never been members. And the belief, it's a belief at the end of the day, you see them talking about the fact that associations don't do anything for driver instructors. I kind of hope in my way, I've done my way, my, my bit to disprove that in terms of helping people over COVID. But you know, I, I, I don't know where it comes from. So something must happen. And somebody says, they've asked the associations and the association has not been able to do anything. Probably about test waiting times, probably about test centre toilets getting closed because of health and safety regulations. And, you know, I'm sorry, driving instructor associations can't override the health and safety executive. We're working on it, you know. But I don't know where, where the bitterness will come from beliefs or it will come from a story they've heard from somewhere. Generally speaking, they won't have been members I and mean, they probably just use it as an excuse not to go to meetings. There was a second part to that question. Well, it, it was for the message, but I'll, I'll touch back on that in a second because it's interesting you're saying about coming from a, the bitterness, potentially coming from a story because it just it just sprung true to me because my most local test centre doesn't have a car park, so we park on the road. And back when I went there with my trainer, so when I was a PDI, I explicitly told me you need to park facing down the hill. That's where the examiners want you to park. If you don't park there, you stop won't go for your test. Now, this is like seven years ago. I don't know if it was the last test or the test before, but everyone had gone out except one examiner. They were no show. And all the other instructors had buggered off, and it was just me and this examiner left. So I thought, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask him, because I don't want to embarrass myself in front of the instructor. And I said, why do we always have to park facing down the hill? Why is that a rule? And he went, it ain't. It's never been a rule. Just everyone always parks that way. Like, yeah, so someone told me that once and it stuck in my head and I'm just taking it as gospel because my trainer told me, so therefore it must be true. And it's that thing, like you say, someone tells you a story about the NJC or any association and it's stuck in your head. And it, rather than becoming a something you question, it becomes a, a fable because if you ask a question about it, well, then you look stupid because you're the one asking the, the question. So I think that's a, something I've not considered before, but I think it's a valid point. I think, I think another reason is from a lack of understanding about what associations are supposed to do. And you could probably liken this to attitudes to the DVSA. So you know, people get angry at the DVSA because they think that they're supposed to, they're a regulator and they have this kind of misguided belief that they're supposed to look after driving instructors. They're supposed to be you know, providing training for driving instructors, whatever they think the DVSA should be doing that is not in the DVSA's, re DVSA's remit. I think the, the same thing happens with associations and we quite often are confronted by people who think that the NGC is some kind of union, which is not the case either. either. You know, we're not here to stand up for your rights as self-employed people. That's, that's, that, that, that's not our job either. Our job is to represent you if you need representation. Our job is to help you develop as driving instructors and self-employed individuals. But you know we're not we're not going to get uh, this. This came up a few years ago. We're not we're not going to organise a strike of driving instructors across the country because that's that's not a remit. That's not in our constitution. So I think I think that that that's a big part of it as well. I mean, I'm, my involvement in the NGC just now is very much. There's a lot of things changing in the NGC at the moment because of the the size we've grown to in a very short period of time. The 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 structure we've had for for so many years with Neil Peake and Peter, the treasurer, and Sue, that's not going to be sustainable in the long term, the way the membership numbers are going. So there's a lot going to change that Dan's involved in, in terms of us developing into more of a business structure, I think. And my 
role in that, I hope, is going to be developing us into more of a leadership organization as opposed to a representative body. So at the moment, the representation is the top. You know, it's, that's, that's what we do. I would like to see leadership added alongside representation. And I'm, I'm pushing for that within the NGC Governing Committee. Well, I haven't watched them yet, but I'm enjoying the the new 10-minute takeaways. I will be enjoying the new 10-minute takeaways. I enjoy the concept, and uh, I think I need to get in with my 15-minute Fridays first. <laughs> it's uh, it's amusing me greatly. But do you know what? I'm just going to mention one other thing, because just when you mentioned like strike aid and union, it, every night, it seems like once every three or four months we'll see someone jump on social media and say, I'm starting a union. Who's with me? And they expect 30,000 people to come along and say, yes, me, I'll help you. But then no one does. And then they throw a little tantrum the next day. And it's like, well, A, it's not the best idea. And B, you actually need to work. You can't just say it and expect everyone to run on. And I think that's the thing. People don't see the work that goes on behind the scenes of a lot of stuff that goes out there, including the the NGAC. But yeah, I think that just we'll we'll touch briefly on this before I move on. And that's the the message you might have for anyone that is bitter towards the associations. Go go for a walk. <laughs> um, I, I I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't get angry about it. Do you know, I'm I'm quite chilled about it. I get. You know, I don't have time to take everything personally. Certainly not on behalf of a an organisation. I don't know. It's the same as a. It's like getting a bad review. That's complete nonsense, isn't it? Yeah, it it doesn't bother me. Join an association, or don't. That's fine. Yeah. Do do me, do do you do you. Someone asked me the other day, what do you say to people that don't like your podcasts? I said, don't listen. It's, it's, um, it makes me chuckle. All right, so this this last point, my third takeaway, I've, I've not really got a question for this, so maybe I'm, I'm going to say what it is, and I'll let you share your thoughts and elaborate. It was the the idea of all, we're talking about coaching, and the idea, your phrase was used, was all driving instructors need to be coaches. And we're kind of talking around the concept of not necessarily like the questioning techniques and the goal setting, it was very much around the idea of the way we are with people. So we're taking away that that judgment. We're, you know, taking people for what they show us. We're not, I'm using the same word again, but not being overly judgmental, that side of it. And I can remember when I edited the podcast, it's very rare when I do a first edit that I stop and go back. A first edit is all about cleaning up the audio. It's not about the content. But that one, I stopped and I went back and I listened to it a couple of times. And I think every time I've listened to the episode since, I go back and I listen to that a bit again because I think it's really interesting. So I would suggest that anyone listening to this now, I didn't make a note at the timestamp for you all, but I would just go back and, and check that a bit out. But yeah, I just wondered if you wanted to expand on that or indulge us in that a bit more, that idea that we all need to be coaches for those sort of reasons. So I guess this is the bit about approaching people with the assumption that they, they're, they're capable individuals. Yes. Yeah. Is, is it that bit? Yeah, so it's about coaching as a mindset as opposed to a few skills and techniques that you pick, you pick up along the way. And I don't know how the best to develop that, Terry. I think maybe maybe a good analogy is to bring back hospitality again. Sorry if that's repetitive and boring for everyone. When I was listening back to it today, I was very conscious of the fact that when I was talking about hotels and my job in hotels, <laughs> well, first of all, it made it sound like I didn't do anything that my boss just gave me jobs. <laughs> and then obviously, I was reasonably good at my job and I ran big departments in hotels. I think my biggest, in fact, I know my biggest role was at Hilton and I had 50 members of staff, 50 employees in, in, in my departments. So I must have been reasonably good at, if not setting goals, working towards goals and doing objectives and evaluation of when things were working and all that kind of stuff. So if you like, that's the that's the techniques and the skills side of it. I could, I could do that kind of thing. But for a large part of my career, I was a really, really crap manager. I was, as a, as a people person, I was, I was very blunt with people. I was very unsympathetic to, you know, sick days, people turning up late for work. It was very kind of black and white to get 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 the job done, and I think part of the reason it worked. Now that I think back on it, is my boss was an amazing manager, and I think there was might have been a bit of good cop bad cop going on within the departments I ran, and he would come in and do all the all the fluffy stuff as as we call it at Caledonian, the the charity kind of stuff and looking after everyone, and I would I would get the stuff done, 
That, that was my job. So if we bring that into our industry, I think we can have, I think it is, and I've done this myself, it's very, very difficult to have that approach, that instructor-led approach, where you're perhaps doing seven driving lessons a day. And as everyone on this call knows, we find ourselves, we can find ourselves in routines of just, you know, what's that movie called? The Groundhog Day. But it's just the same thing every day. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Okay, bay parking, back to that car park. Okay, first session on roundabouts. Okay, I've got my roundabout route for people who are doing that first. But then I know I've got to throw in some coaching skills. So, so what do you want to do today? Right, okay, yeah, okay. So I've got this really good route around here. Would you like to go and do that? Excellent, that ticks that box. And it's the the, the, the coaching techniques and the skills become like a little bit of kind of seasoning on your very dull dinner which is the same thing every day. And I'm not just talking about driving instructors here, I'm talking about PDI training as well, because I still do a lot of PDI training. I love doing PDI training. But I'm guilty of rinse and repeat and doing the same thing. So I, I ask my guys in, in advance, what, what do they want to do? Go away and think about it. Send me a text a couple of days before, and then we, I, we'll, we'll put a plan together. But I go to the same routes. I stop at the same time after 15 minutes. Interestingly enough, the thing that makes me change on that is when I'm, I've am i got my audit head on. So my audit re-examination was cancelled because the warning card holders had to go and do the tests. But up until that point, I had my audit sheet and that was forcing me to be more involved and be more client-centred. So maybe that's an example of what I mean when I talk about the difference between a coaching approach and coaching te techniques and skills, because anyone can use coaching techniques and skills and throw them into an instructor-led lesson. And if you do that, you're not going to get the full benefit of those things, because what you'll find is you'll ask questions and you'll try and listen, and the person will take too long to answer. Or they'll say the thing that was not the thing that you wanted them to say. And now we're out of a coaching approach. As soon as you start thinking things like, Okay, that's not what I meant when I asked that question. That wasn't the answer I was supposed to be given when I said, how do you feel that went? And your, your client went, ah, I thought that was a bit rubbish. And you go, I'm going to have to do that again now because you thought it was rubbish. That's the difference between coaching approaches and coaching skills because a coaching approach says, okay, so let's t tell me what happened there. And being genuinely interested, was it good? Was it not good? I have no idea. But I've not decided what we're going to do next until you tell me what you think. And it's not this really difficult, Terry. It's really difficult. I've not figured it out myself. But I, I have figured out that it's an issue that, that, that I need to work on and we all need to work on. And it makes the whole, the beauty of it, the beauty of this concept is that it takes the whole argument about coaching techniques and instructional techniques and kind of files it in an irrelevant bin, a kind of, it files it in the the, the 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 2010s filing cabinet, for me anyway, because there are bigger things to work on. I like that. I think you've explained it really well. And they were my three key takeaways. It was the the journey, which I was, again, I saw parallels in and I was fascinated by and looking at the different times you've struggled and, the, you know, that type of stuff. It was the the passion around the NJC, which now I've, I've seen a bit more of, which is cool. And then also, the 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 coaching side of it but if you are sort of watching this now and you have a question or a comment then all i want you to do is go into the chat and either type in type the word me or if you've got a question but you don't want to come onto video type out the question and i'll happily read it and while you're either typing out the word me i'm guessing you've got one gary either type out the word me or type out your question i've just got a couple of more bits i want to run run through with you Stuart, and then I'll, I'll see if anyone wants to come in so the first question I want to ask, or the next question I want to ask you, accident or collision? I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> I knew it. This is the only one I had prepped for. <laughs> so I may have been a bit dismissive on, 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 on that, that episode, but a few weeks ago, our mutual acquaintance, Liz Box, had reposted something on LinkedIn by one of our colleagues. So. Dutch traffic psychologist whose name I'd written down, but it escapes me at the moment. 
I think it's Ezra, Ezra Harms. And what the, the headline of the LinkedIn post, she was sharing a piece of research that she'd done and the head, headline on the LinkedIn post was something like, I'm going to have to find this now. If you expect drivers to pay attention to the roads 100% of the time, then you need to read this article because that will never happen. And if you want drivers who are going to pay attention to the roads 100% of the time, then we're going to need more. We're going to need some ro more robots and, and better robots than we have at the moment. And I do have a couple of notes that I wrote down here. So from her LinkedIn post, I'll send her article to you. I meant to do that today. Humans can't pay full attention to the road all the time because they are human. She talks about default cognitive mode is autopilot, which is really interesting. And it's all based around this idea, which is the, the kind of central bit of her research. I'm going all geeky now. I realize that. Sorry, everyone. This is, this is my thing at the moment. She talks about a familiarity paradox. Now, what that means is when we go, when, maybe not us, we're not good examples because we're advanced drivers, but when a driver drives in a new city where they've never driven before. My example of this is when I drove to Newcastle one time before I became a driving instructor with my then girlfriend, now wife. It's the only time we've ever had an argument, like a full blown out argument, with me trying to drive in Newcastle with her talking to me about something else. It's a, the cognitive load on human beings driving in unfamiliar places is huge, absolutely massive. Like they've done this in European countries with, you know, scanners, the full helmets on, and the brain waves are off the charts, the blood pressure's up, the heart rate's up, all that kind of stuff. And because of that, we get distracted and we, forget to pay attention to things because our brains are overloaded. But the paradox is, from this article, that when we drive in familiar locations, roads and routes that we drive every day, we have a cognitive underload because we don't need, we're using a fraction of our processing powers that we normally do. And the result of that is that we deliberately distract ourselves with other things. Because we don't like this, our, our brains can't think of nothing. Our brains are, in, I, I think, therefore I am. I, I bet nobody's ever quoted Descartes on your <laughs> podcast before today. We, our brains cannot think of nothing. So the, 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 the cognitive underload, the fact that we're on autopilot, is what enables us to be able to flick through the radio stations, get our pals on, on the phone. If we're breaking the law, we're sending text messages. But even at a very basic level, we're talking more to our passengers than we normally do. We're messing around a little bit, having jokes with kids in the back seat. All these deliberate things. And that's the familiarity paradox. So you have cognitive overload, which causes human failure. I'm not calling, calling them accidents. It causes human failure. And we have cognitive underload, which leads to human failure as well. Now, I know I'm going on a bit. Let me just tie it up. Where, we, where I should have taken that conversation on the, first, on the episode we did was to differentiate between accidents and sorry, errors and violations. So when somebody goes out and deliberately drives with, without due care and is reckless or they've stolen a car and they're, they're, they're driving, that's a violation. And then to call that an accident is, is, is not, not right. My, the point that I was trying to get across is that accidents do happen. And I think it's important that whatever terminology we use, that we raise young drivers' awareness of the fact that they are human. Because the idea is that they will be more careful, especially in the first six months of driving. The terminology around it, let's not call a fatal collision an accident, I'm, I'm all on board with. I'm, I'm on board with that completely. But it is semantics slightly, Terry. It is semantics. And I had a really interesting discussion. Do you know, I've, I've, I seem to have form of the, the, these kind of slightly controversial things. We had, had, had a conversation with Sue Duncan last year about drunk drivers being sent to prison and increasing jail terms for drunk drivers. And I found myself making the argument that if... I can't believe I'm going to say this on the podcast and talk about this, but I, this is what I genuinely believe that we, we have issues with in, in society. If somebody commits a murder, a domestic murder, as a result of being under 
tremendous stress, mental abuse and physical abuse to the extent that they are emotionally impacted by that and their decision-making faculties, faculties are affected, then that is very unlikely that person receives the same treatment as somebody who's committed manslaughter or murder with no, none of those, those factors present. When somebody drives at excessive speed when they're under the influence of alcohol, they are not in full control of the, the decision-making processes. Their brains are affected. Chem the chemically, their brains are affected and their de decision-making processes are affected. Regardless of whether or not, and I know the, the argument goes back to, you know, they chose to drive when they were sober. That's, that's not always the case. So the, all this stuff is the background behind accidents and crashes. And I think shortly after our episode, there was something in the news about it or some, one of the road safety charities put something out. And I'm on board with the spirit of it, but I think there's a bigger, there's a bigger issue at a society level around how brains work and driver psychology and the human body and brain chemistry that interests me and interests lots of other people, but we just don't know enough about it yet. It's fascinating. Maybe that's another episode for another day. <laughs> but it was the it was the government department that mandated that they were going to use it to collisions over accidents quite recently. I don't know. I think that another discussion, another day. That was really interesting. It's, uh, it's huge, Terry. Do you know this is verging on philosophical? Do you know it's 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 above it's above my pay grade. I, I, I'm a, you know I, I'm just I'm just an amateur at this kind of thing, an enthusiast, but it interests me greatly. And everyone's entitled to opinion, and often it's the people who are below their pay grade that give the relevant opinions because they're not influenced by as much stuff. But yeah, maybe that's. I think we need to get. I wasn't expecting to go that deep. I'm not going to lie. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, I do. It was well worth listening to. But yeah, we'll we'll, we'll p put a pin in that one, and uh, we'll say that I was right with collisions, and we'll move on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we have to go. We have to go with the award-winning podcast. Come on. Yeah. It's very rare I do that and say, right, I'm saying this thing and then we're moving on. But Gary, you did have a question and you typed it out, but that's a very long one for me to ask. So do you want to come on and ask Stuart your question? Yeah, okay. I, I can come on. I can come on. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, Gary. Hello, Gary. Yeah. Hi, hi. How are you, Stuart? I'm good, mate. How are you? Your grip? Yeah, good. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's been a long day. Just getting back just in time for this one. I was not prepared. I, was, I missed the first few minutes, so I do apologise if any of this was covered in in the first few minutes. But a couple of things actually, and I don't know if you want to ignore some of what I say. I'll address all of it in 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 turn. The honest truth. How I, I listened to a little bit of the recent chat that you had with Ollie, and just wondering how, as a PDI, I would. If there's anything you recommend as a PDI, how to get better involved in the honest truth? Maybe that's a question for Ollie, but I know you're working closely with Ollie and you've got something set up for within Bright Coaching where, you, where you're working alongside the honest truth. So I wondered if you had any info on that firstly. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't get involved as a PDI with the honest truth. I think that one of the things you're trying to do at this moment in your career is build up a reputation as a solid driving instructor who delivers value for money. And there's no better way to do that than to be offering plugins like The Honest Truth. It's really simple. You get an app, you do a bit of training on the app, and then you pitch it out to your, your learner driver. I have to say, I, I, I don't pitch it out to learner drivers, but I do show it to PDIs and I recommend it to them. You, you're, you're our bright coaching, Gary Thomas, yeah? That's, that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's the, fine. The second just, cohort, is, yeah. That's fine, just in case there was two Gary Thomases. So you do get 12 months, 12 months, six months or 12 months access. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's 12 actually. 12, yep. I, I did, yeah. All he's, all he's got my, my arm up my back there and it's 12 months. And, but that won't kick in until the end of module two. So you're not going to have that benefit from Bright Coaching until what, near the end of the year. Yeah. yeah, October, November. So what you could do is just go and appear as you go kind of thing with Ollie just now, with the honest truth just now. And then just pause your subscription. And then you, you piggyback onto our subscription. And there you go. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate that, Stuart. I did have a couple of, but I I'm, I'm just conscious of taking up too much time here. If someone else wants to jump in with a, with a question, that, that's fine. But I do have a couple more if you offer go for it. to them. Go yeah. for it. Uh, 
second one was I'm current. Well, I'm starting my advanced motorcycle training in March, and wondered if there was a crossover between the two. If what you're doing there at Bright Coaching, do you have on the first cohort any kind of motorcycle trainers, or are you more focused on in car? And if you knew if there was a crossover that would be helpful, I don't know of any crossover. I don't know if there's any bikers or biker trainers on the qualification. I know about probably the 60 to 70% of cohort one. I'm pretty sure the ones I don't know are car driving instructors. So, so unless Fiona knows something that I don't know about the people. No, sorry, not, not my specialist area at all. Not my area at all, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's fine. Just, just thought it might be worth asking. I'm sure it would come into to play somewhere along the line, but maybe I'll have to figure that out for myself along the way. Um, I mean, I think I think in terms of behavioural change in bikes, I did see one thing recently from the IEM, and it was around, you, you'll know what they're called better than I will, in Scotland, they introduced some new lines on the road, and these lines are called, mm-hmm. they have a particular name, do you know what I'm talking about? I do, but I don't know the name of them. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is that it's just giving bikers a path to follow that mm. guides them into the most, the, the safest areas for going around bends. And they've. Yeah, the safest line around each bend, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they, 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 they rolled it out in Scotland. And I don't know how they track it cameras or something like that, or speeds or sort of average speeds. But it's working, it's, it's proven to work. So that's a good example of a behavioural mm. change technique in work for, for bikers. And I know the, the IEM were talking about that and they were quite keen to to promote that at their recent, not their event, but they were talking at an event I was at and that was brought up as a behavior, a successful behavioural change intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. And 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 one like, well, I was going to ask about it. It was about the rebrand. You might be touching on this anyway, but that last segment about when you went deep though with Terry, that, that was really interesting actually. I'd love to a follow up on that on, a, on another episode like Terry mentioned. That would be certainly something I'd, I'd love to listen to if you dug a little deeper on that. Yeah, I mean, the whole ethics mm. around what mm. you do for a living is, is, is interesting. I, I do have an interest in ethics from a previous kind of thing that I was doing. Yeah, I mean, that, that we, we just have to be careful mm. with how we do that because things can be misrepresented on a, on a public yeah. forum, I guess. In terms of, did you, did you mention the rebrand there? I could talk about that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Again, I, I heard a little of it and the conversation with Chris Benstead, was it? Just that I heard a couple of days ago, but I was listening to it after the fact. I couldn't make the actual Sunday night, Sunday evening thing. So I just heard a bit of it the following day. And yeah, really interested in that. And I'm not sure whether you're going to touch upon it anyway, but. I'll, I'll mention it because yourself and Fiona are here. Fiona's on court. One, the qualification was written as a professional development award. That's what I told SQA that I wanted because when I looked at what they had and the subjects that I wanted to cover, that was that was what it looked like it should be. It fitted in line with BTEC Level 4 in terms of the level. It sounded pretty cool. Do you know, PDA Level 7, BTEC Level 4, that from a marketing perspective, that sounded um, decent. And it was only about six weeks ago that I found out about that I, I was able to call it a professional di- diploma. I don't think I was allowed to call it a professional diploma because I thought that was limited to colleges. I don't, I don't know why I thought that. It was just a bit of ignorance on my part. So I, I approached them and asked them if we could change it to a professional diploma, to which they said, well, yes, I don't think they were very happy about it, but you need to do this. And you need to change a couple of things if you want to do that. So I've done that. And yeah, it's like 99% signed off and sealed so that, that that's what it's going to be so it'll be it's now going to be a professional diploma in coaching behavioral change in driver psychology i don't know if i'm going to call it a pd level seven i don't i've not decided yet but we'll see mm. nothing nothing changes from your guys perspective because you hadn't seen the assignments anyway mm. and yeah but it's yeah just it's it's exciting from a, in a geeky kind of way yeah I mean, it's a diploma not an award it sounds better yeah Brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate that. Pleasure. Cheers, Gary. And just touching on one thing you said about the the, the ethics, the road safety side of it, just keep your eyes peeled for the, the driving instructors. Driving instructors, divisions, aerials. Oh, God, jeepers. 
driving instructors Edit. to vision zero stuff that's coming out there's a whole host of stuff coming out this year so yeah keep your eyes peeled for that but yeah Stuart, is there anything else that you want to touch on looking back over the episode or because i've covered my key points there no, I don't think so. I think that was really good, Terry. I didn't know what your key takeaways were going to be. I deliberately didn't ask you in advance. Yeah, the the, the two things that kind of stood out for me were Graham as a mentor and my, my career path and all that kind of stuff and the, the accident collision thing. But yeah, I probably did go on a wee bit too much about that there at the end. So rabbit hole. Yes, very much. Not going on too much, but definitely a rabbit hole. But yeah, thank you for joining us on that first episode and uh, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you. So a big thank you to both Dr. Elizabeth Box and Bright Coach and Stuart Locker for joining me on those episodes. As I mentioned, both of those have been taken from my premium vault where there are over 75 hours of exclusive trainings available for you to go and listen and in a lot of instances, watch right now. Also, just want to take a moment to remind you that this season, season seven, is sponsored by Bright Coaching. To find out more on what they've got to offer, head over to brightcoaching.net and sign up to the newsletter to make sure you're keeping regular touch with what is coming out over there. And if you have liked what you've heard today, make sure you go and check out the Instructor Podcast Premium. You can sign up for a free trial that lasts a full week. And if you don't like what you hear in that first week, then you are welcome to cancel and it won't cost you a penny. But the majority of people that sign up stay for a long time because they see the content that's over there and agree with most of people within the premium membership that quite simply, it is the best value CPD available. So thank you guys for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this quite a a big, long episode today. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, let's just keep raising standards. The Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. If you're still listening, I'm going to take the opportunity to remind you of two things. First of all, go and click subscribe. Second of all, I don't know if I've mentioned this today, but check out the Instructor Podcast Premium, www.theinstructorpodcast.com. Have a great day.